As a boy, I read all the science fiction books that I could find, especially those with robots in them, because I was captivated by the almost unlimited amounts of work that those machines could do for us. In those books, robots always looked like mechanical copies of men, so I decided to start a career in mechanical engineering, dreaming of building humanoid robots. Soon, I learned that this is not just a boy's dream, it's actually a necessity for all of us. Um, currently, in the Netherlands, we have, for every elderly person, we have four people of working age. But this number will change. And I want to try that out here in this room. Uh, I would like to ask in the audience, everybody who is aged 45 years or older, to please raise your hand. So look around. It's quite a bit. Do you realize that all of you will be retired 20 years from now, or maybe 22. <laughs> now, everybody aged under 45, please raise your hand and look around. Do you realize it's up to us to do all the work for the entire audience? <laughs> and but actually, this is a very young audience. In the Netherlands, the numbers are even worse. In 2032, the numbers will go down to two to one. So if we want to maintain the same lifestyle, uh, we will have to double our productivity. And the only way to do that is by using robots. <laughs> now, I have to admit, um, I have to grow up. I had to grow up a little bit and accept that those robots will not look like mechanical Ben. But today, I can tell you that by taking inspiration from the human body, we can build robotic systems for the future. And I will be talking about three things. The first one is robot legs that will um, be the basis for robotic suits to help disabled people be more self-reliant. The second thing is robot hands for an increased productivity in the food industry. And the third I want to talk about today is robot arms for the general produc production industry. I'll start with legs. Now, if you want to build a robot suit to help someone become more self-reliant or to help rehabilitate, the suit needs to be lightweight and efficient. And unfortunately, the problem is current day technology for walking robots is not lightweight and is not efficient. You've all seen those, um, you know, um, robots that look like a little person in a spacesuit, and there's always something robotic about their way of walking. And um, that the reason is that they're actually trying too hard. They're sort of, um, you know, they're too uptight. And I can explain that using a, a, a simulation, and we're going to analyze the motion of the green leg. So you see that if the green leg goes forward, the graph goes up, and if the green leg goes backward, the graph goes down. So the graph that you're seeing here represents the motion of that green leg. And it becomes really interesting when we look at the behavior after a disturbance. So I'm going to throw a ball at it, and it's going to frantically try to stick to the plan. And as you can see, the alarm bells go off, and yes, it did it. Within one step, it's back to the original motion plan. Although it works, this just takes too much unnecessary energy. So we ask, can't we take inspiration from the human way of walking? How do, you actu how do humans actually do that? And here you see uh, a simulation of what's called passive dynamic walking, which captures the essence of human walking. This was invented by Ted McGear. Now, if you look at this walking motion, it's not much different from the previous one, okay? But it becomes interesting as soon as we throw a ball at this one as well. So, the ball will hit the leg, and as a result, the leg will make a bigger step. As a natural result of that, it will make a, a small step, and another small step, and it slowly converges back to a normal motion. And as you can see, it's no longer at the original plan, because who cares about the original plan? The only thing you care about is that you can make another step, and another step, and another step. So we use this as the basis for the next generation robots. We built a large number of robots uh, in our laboratory, some of them uh, even with no motors at all. And now, universities of Delft and Twente together are building the next generation of robotic suits. Thank you. 
So next, I would like to talk about hands. <laughs> hands for the fruit, uh, fruits and vegetables. So do you know that in the Netherlands, we produce about a billion of these things per year? And each of them individually is being put in a machine to be packaged by a person, by hand, one per second, eight hours per day, all year long. Now the problem is, they're all different. The size and the shape are different, and also you have to be really, really careful with them. So that's not uh, something that current day robots can, can do. They're good at, um, you know, mechanical parts that are always the same, but biological parts, that's really difficult. So we thought, can't we take inspiration from the way the human hand works? And so, if you look at the bones um, of the human finger, you can find a very interesting uh, design feature in it, and that's the way the muscles are connected to the bones. So, for example, there's um, a connection between um, the, the top and the middle part of the finger to one muscle, so only one muscle for two parts. And there's another one uh, that uh, has the same configuration. And in general, there are fewer muscles to control your hand than you have degrees of freedom. And the result is that you're not able um, to control the finger parts individually. And the benefit of this design feature becomes clear when you try to grasp something. Here you see a robotic version of such a hand with just one motor pulling the finger and successfully grasping a round object. But now, if you give it a box, you can see the finger automatically becomes ad adopts the box shape. And the red arrows indicate that the contact forces are equal and so it's also careful. Now, um, this, is be, this is called under-actuation in the, in the field of robotics. It's a general technology, but we ex expanded it um, to be able to use one motor to control an entire hand with three fingers, and this has led to a uh, patented technology which we now implemented in a spin-off company uh, to help increase the productivity in the fruit and vegetable business. And perhaps this might also lead to uh, more applications in the, in the future. Currently remote controlled, but look at the hand. This time, giving me a drink. Thank you. So cute. <laughs>
and they also don't have timing issues, but they have other issues. And a very important issue in robotics is friction. There's always a large, a large and unknown amount of friction in the joints. And so we wanted to use the same idea of smart motions to increase accuracy. So here we built uh, a very simple arm. It has no sensor. And it has a motor that is just uh, given a signal, a feed forward signal. So you just turn it on and off in a predefined manner irrespective whether the robot reaches the target or not. So we tuned it such that it exactly reaches the target. So this is still uh, nothing special. And also we, we tuned two motions. The first one you saw is the straightforward A to B motion, the dump motion. And the other one is the smart motion. And the smart motion is slightly different because it first goes a little bit in the opposite direction and then it moves towards the red line. Now the interesting bit is when we start teasing these things. So we um, tighten a screw, drastically increasing the friction, but we're not changing the uh, motor commands. And so now we're looking at the result of that um, tease. As you can see, the dump motion doesn't reach the target, the smart motion still reaches the target. And the, the cause of that is that the smart motion goes back first, where it's being hampered by the friction, so it doesn't go back as far. It also doesn't build up as much speed as it would have. And that compensates exactly all of the uh, friction errors that it's getting in the other direction. So, we're still in the middle of uh, this research. I don't really know uh, um, which other issues we can solve with it, but I'm excited by the idea that we can get extra accuracy for free by just moving in a smarter way, <laughs> just like humans.